You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Welcome to First Contact, the greatest podcast in the known galaxy. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This time we are watching the game which first aired the week of October 28th, 1991. It had a story by Susan Sackett, Fred Bronson and Brandon Braga and a teleplay by Brandon Braga. It was directed by Corey Allen. James, what happens in this one? Riker brings something back from Riser and soon all of the crew have it. Except for Wesley, because as we know, there are some games he doesn't know how to play. The whole crew ends up addicted to an augmented reality game which requires players to get little discs into little cups. But there's something more sinister at work, as the game alters brain chemistry making players highly suggestible. So Wesley teams up with Robin Leffler, a bright young engineer with a can-do attitude and a set of rules. Can they save the ship, just like the good old days, while also being a little preachy? We have to hope so. Well Alex, you'd never seen this episode before, were you happy to see the return of Wesley Crusher? Well, first, I think it's worth saying that people should remember our dedication to this podcast, not only that we're still here after all these years, but I gave up my bank holiday evening to sit and watch this when I I could have been spending the last day of my bank (laughs) holiday doing literally anything else. I had to turn to my wife and say, no, I've, I've got to get the game on, which led to disappointment, thinking that there'd be some sort of sitcom from the 90s with an agoraphobic man, um, just just for the niche references that make no sense to any Americans, you know. Always like to get one of them in. Um, I th- <laughs> well, it has Wesley. It has a very season one, season two vibe to it. There's some very creepy stuff that Wesley's doing, verging on slightly sex pesty. Um, I should hate it, and you know what? I kind of enjoyed it. I don't really know why. <laughs> What's what's the sex pesty stuff? I don't know. It just feels creepy. Sex pest isn't the word. It, it does feel creepy. I do agree with that. But that's because Ashley Judd is about four years older and looks about six or seven years older because Will Wheaton seems far younger than nineteen, which he was at the time. He just he comes across like a a fourteen year old boy with his first potential girlfriend, the way that he's sort of leaning over her, almost as if trying to rub his genitals on her shoulder. It's just, I don't know, just something about it just sent the hairs on the back of my neck up in a bad way. Yeah, I definitely felt that, but that seems more like a mismatch. Like, they've they've paired somebody who's a bit too old for him, really. Yeah, I I mean, also, that is his character, you know. The, the sort of slightly desperate teenage boy. Admittedly, we'd sort of moved beyond that a bit, but if you're going to do it with anyone, it sort of makes sense that it's with Wesley. But, yeah. The, the, the thing is, though, that, that those those elements aside, that, that should be, in, in any other episode, that would be enough to make me really hate this. And somehow it didn't. They're trying to make him more of a... A young leading man. He's got a new haircut. He's a bit more confident. He's doing a sort of action thing. He's, I guess, they're trying to make him a little bit like a little bit less boy genius who saves the ship. Instead, they make him sort of teenage genius who saves the ship. <laughs> yeah. But do do you think like that they have adapted his character suitably? Do you think do you see an evolution there? No, no. Uh, it 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 didn't feel particularly developed beyond well as beyond that he had a, a sort of love interest that actually reciprocated any feeling which dialed down a bit of the annoyance I, I think more than anything it's just the episode that they were in it was just that it was kind of fun I mean ridiculous absolutely ridiculous and high camp but still fun yeah so I, I guess we start on Riza. Riker is with another one of his uh, many women, I assume he picked up using his Horgon. They're having a bit of a chase. She's got his badge, and, and then, you know, he she 
puts them down and says, you've got to try this. And Riker will, will always put something new on his head if a woman asks him. So, yeah, this game. Do you feel seeing the game maybe lessened the impact of it? You've got to remember mm. that this aired in 1991. This was, was cutting edge. Augmented reality wasn't even an idea, I don't think, at that point. Yeah, they had the um, the Nintendo console, didn't they, at that time? I mean, I, I remember a little... Uh, yeah, there were little computers I wanted to buy that put basically a little LED display, like 2D in front of your eyes and things like that. And obviously virtual reality. The virtual reality we have now was in every sort of TV show around the 90s, maybe into the mid-90s. But it seemed this idea that this thing was happening... But I'm not sure it was it was going to be uh get the disc into the the cup game like you might see on on a Wii. Oh blimey! The it was the Virtual Boy I was thinking of, and that was 1995 that came out. That's as as far away from this episode as Ashley Judd was from Will Wheaton. <laughs> I mean, that game as well. I I assume that there's meant to be some sort of euphemistic euphemistic subtext to that. Get the disc in the cup. <laughs> Unless, you know, I've just got a filthy mind. Perhaps, perhaps it would have been clearer if he'd been playing some sort of VR version of Beat 'em and Eat 'em or something like that. God, that'd be horrific. The whole episode does feel a little bit like a metaphor for someone bringing an STD back from holiday. <laughs> that, I, I think that's unintentional. I think that's filthy minds thinking that. It is. <laughs> Is it? But yeah, one of the they're, they're they're basically well, like in Red Dwarf, you only use the AR machine to have sex. They're all they're all using it to have a great big wank. I I don't think that they are coming in their pants. I, I think that <laughs> <laughs> not so sure. Is that, is that the first time we've said that on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> and you one for the t-shirt range. The one of the writers has specified Tetris as the inspiration for this. <laughs> Jesus, I've I have never had that reaction to Tetris. I, I mean, not I unless you get one of the long ones into a particularly tight spot. But but that that scene where Wesley walks in on on Doctor Crusher, <laughs> and you know she's making sort of quite quite sexual noises. I can't say I, I know what noises women make when they're happy, um, but I assume it's something like that. Uh, 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 and and it really does have the feel of someone, of Wesley walking in on his mum having a wank. Well, it doesn't really, because he acts very nonchalant about it, really. How else are you supposed well, to react? It's, it's very normal in the future, isn't it? It's all accepted. What happens on Riser stays on Riser until it comes back to the ship. And I, I think the the thing as well, it, it's I think it's very sinister. Um, Beverly saying, "Oh, you've got to try it. Why don't you bring your date back here and we can all try it together?" <laughs> oh, the start of so many a porn film. I, I just think maybe it, it's not there. I feel there are definitely elements of it being well, that, there. That's but... that's exactly why it's not there. She's his mother. I know. But it just, it, it does, it, to me, watching it with obviously my very sad, broken, twisted mind, that that is that is just what I thought. That that it just, it seemed like there was a subtext there. See, I was watching it thinking of more recently things like Farmville and the various Facebook games or like Candy Crush and things like that, where people get addicted to them and they get that joy out of getting that next level that it just makes perfect sense and the the kind of expressions that they're delivering which you might read as an orgasm is just the only way they can kind of translate that joy that 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 little dopamine hit that you get when you you get something from your phone whether that's a retweet or lots of likes on your TikTok dancing videos as as you guys both do um or or something like that yeah i i understand i understand the the visual representation of of joy 
I mean, I've done no reading around it, but the the the, the sexual side of it is is something sort of thinking about it since to a degree. I mean, my first reaction to it was, oh, this is a, a like with Red Dwarf and Better Than Life, this is a, a spin on sort of drug addiction. You know, I'm watching it and thinking, just say no. Nothing to do with the, the drugs. I'm just thinking, no, no, God, no. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I would assume, without reading around, because I have better things to do with my time than go through Memory Alpha, I assume drug addiction was the the inspiration here. No, it, it, it was Tetris. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's really into that old Tetris. You've got to remember handheld consoles were a new thing at at this point in time. So, yeah, and I guess there was that fear as well. The kids just sit there looking at the screen. Oh oh my, if that generation could see what the world is like today. But I do understand that. And and maybe this is like, you know, this I don't think this is actually, despite the slightly tongue-in-cheek synopsis. Like, if you think back to, to that scene between Wesley and Tasha Yar in the first season where they have a very earnest conversation about how drugs are wrong, but sometimes people just want to escape. Th- this This feels actually just, okay, they've taken that as their jumping off point. I'm not sure there's really anything with more depth to it other than you can do a sort of fun conspiracy on the Enterprise type story where it's almost just this this paranoid episode where Wesley doesn't know what's happening, the entire crew are affected and, and it's up to one person just to, to solve that problem. It's it's a kind of classic Star Trek setup. It's, it's Dr. Crusher's line, if there's nothing wrong with me, maybe there's something wrong with the universe. And it's an episode that, if it was made in the original series, would be a sort of take on the Red Scare, wouldn't it? I, I suppose. Is that, yeah. that that paranoia element that so informs fifties uh, B movie sci fi, for example? Uh, yeah, and there there is a body snatcher element to it because obviously everyone oh, yeah. is is acting out of character. I, I think probably the most most powerful scene seems like it's giving it a bit too much credit. But when Wesley <laughs> goes and confronts the captain. And and says, "Oh, there's this game on," and he goes, "Oh, oh, I'll I'll look into that for you, Wesley." And then he turns around and puts the headset on, and it's like, "Oh, no, that's an ad break. That's 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 some good stuff there." I mean, I, I mean, it's it's cheap, but actually, it it works really well. I I, I watched that one. Oh, that's quite good. Yeah. Perhaps the problem, or actually it's not a problem, because it's perfectly functional on the surface level this exists. We don't really get into the, well, what are they thinking? How much of their brains been not? Why do they all want to obey this? It's not, it's not like they've been properly brainwashed, really, but it, wh- why is it they want to give the ship to these people? Is there just a signal that's saying, do this? And they obviously do the science scene where they say this is how it affects the brain it's got psychotropic capabilities oh it affects this part of the brain but actually that's all just kind of techno babble really and it doesn't matter to be honest it probably would have benefited for i mean the, the red dwarf comparisons in this are, are going to keep coming up because obviously better than life is has a lot of similarities with this but i i actually think if they'd gone further down that route, that might have helped a little bit because the least consequential part is the plot of oh, and they they're being controlled. In act, whereas in actual fact, if it had just been an addictive game, that that would have streamlined the plot a bit. I mean, it's not it's not uh, ruinous to the episode by any stretch of the imagination. It just would have solidified it a bit. I think it it didn't need that extra element really. But wouldn't that be? I mean, I say I say this, but we've already had an episode similar to this, and we will have another one later this season. But wouldn't just a game which everyone gets addicted to and suddenly can't function anymore? Isn't that similar kind of to the Naked Now? Yeah, but that was shit. So. <laughs> you know, the, there's there's always the scope to. Do it again and do it better. There's always the scope to do it worse as well, but I I think and I, and I guess this is this is doing conspiracy from season one better. 
Yeah. I mean, five seasons in, I, I think you have the right to retry an idea and and improve on it. I, you know, I, I don't think it's an unjustified thing to do. No. And I guess, given how powerful this technology is that, that will never, ever come up again... Do you think it's satisfying that it's just a sort of random alien of the week whose agenda I neither remember nor care about? Oh, we need your ship for a thing. Would it have been better if it was the Romulans or something like that? Or do you think it's better just to leave this in a little self-contained box? I I think self-contained, but if it's not going to be self-contained, yeah, having, having a known enemy would make a bit more sense. If it was a Romulan plot or something like that, well, that the would... Ferengi, the Ferengi want the Enterprise to sell it. Yeah, and the reason that would that would work better for me is that I don't need that to be a focus of the plot. The reason that I think it would streamline stuff down if if there was no outside race is that that's kind of inconsequential. It's just giving a justification to why the things are happening, which you don't really need if you have to have an outside race having that prior knowledge just speeds things up a little bit and gets you back to the the body snatcher horror plot that you really want to focus in on. Anything else is kind of just extraneous plot filler, just to tie it all up. We don't really delve into the other alien race anyway. Well, that's that's my point. It's, 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 it's pointless bringing in a new race to do that because... You either end up spending too long on them, or you don't spend any time, and then it becomes an inconsequential plot. And obviously, the latter is what happens here. Whereas, if you come in with that prior knowledge of a race, it just it just speeds it up a bit. I suppose it's it's kind of effective in in the sense of we open with this random alien wooing Riker, but then who doesn't immediately suspect the random alien? <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's only because we we understand the pattern. After five seasons, I bloody hope so. Uh, talking of uh, extraneous plot strands, what, what did you think of them throwing the perhaps the most... I, I don't know, is it the most sinister? The, the weakest surprise for Wesley? We are going to stand in the dark and then go, surprise... I didn't. I didn't really understand. I guess. Guess that's maybe things aren't always what they seem. Sometimes things are hidden in darkness, and there's cake. I baked you pound cake. Uh, yeah, I mean, both their com- their confrontation there and their confrontation with Data. Yeah, they're both a little lackluster, but in some respects, it just adds to a sort of campy feel to the whole thing. I mean, it's it's quite so. It's quite like a '60s episode, really. You could easily imagine this in the original series. Well, I mean, it was it was pitched by Susan Sackett, who was Gene Roddenberry's assistant. So uh, it, it certainly, it certainly has roots uh, in in Star Trek's illustrious history. You know, going right back to the man himself, and uh, the script I think had been knocking around for a while because uh, basically, I think it reached the point where they'd run out of ideas. I think, as well, you could go down a more sinister route. You you could make those confrontations more chilling. You could make everything a bit more horror based. You you could have people visibly showing the signs of uh, of being in the game, and you, you know, or it would almost sort of turn into a sort of zombie thing when you start to see the effects on people's bodies and faces and whatnot. Yeah, them them forgetting to eat and them hurting themselves and that kind of thing, yeah. that, which is very much in the, in the Red Dwarf novel. Absolutely, and that 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 would be a totally legitimate way of going, but that would be such a drastically different episode. I I don't know if I'd feel about it the same way, oddly, because part of the charm of it here is that that campy element, uh, the sinister but not really element to it, that just made it a bit of fun. So I, I don't know. It's diff- it's difficult to say if you switched it the other way if that would actually be for the better. I kind of think maybe it wouldn't. I, I don't think you want it to get too serious because it, it, in some ways this show doesn't have a lot of consequences, and, and you want to have a nice time while you're watching it. In a lot of ways, and if that sort of 
unraveling a mystery rather than full-on body horror then i think that's probably the way to go you could probably do this episode in in any version of star trek and do a slightly different spin on it but i i did also have that thought it's half the plot of first contact isn't it the film basically you know just just replace the game with the borg yeah, well that, I guess you could say that about about so many things. There there are elements of the of the horror. I think you know, Doctor Crusher obviously having turns and switching data off. That that's a little bit of a horror inflection. And and then you have, I think the scene at the end where they hold Wesley's eyes open and put the game in to force him to play it. I think that very much feels. A bit Clockwork Orange, as I'm sure it's supposed mm. to, but yeah, I think it's probably the right balance. It's it's a family show. Sometimes they do get that wrong. That that episode where none of them could sleep and their dreams were were coming into reality and they were seeing visions. That could have been a lot more uh, horror focused, but th- this this I think works because it also works as a sort of action investigation. Uh, and yeah, I I do actually think. Wesley is a good vehicle for this. It's a familiar character. Uh, he's coming back, and then you get to see all the actual regulars acting a little bit out of character. So, so you get that nice outside perspective, but also, it's essentially a series regular. I don't think that you could really do this as as the kind of dark approach. If you did it in Deep Space Nine, I mean, Deep Space Nine already has a couple of episodes that are quite similar to this, and they take it in a very dark way. But you have to kind of have it be a light, fun episode if it's in TNG. I'm even surprised by, at the end, they don't even try to shoot Wesley. They don't even pull out a phaser, do they? It's literally just trying no. to catch him. Yeah, it's, it's very much a chase. that They don't seem to have murderous intent which I, I guess is maybe you just don't want to cross that line with the characters you don't want to believe under any circumstances even if they are being controlled that they can be murderous something they'll throw out of the, the window with data at some point but uh, yeah and, and I think that that would be a problem but I also don't think it really impacts the stakes there's no point I was watching it really you know, as an ordinary viewer going, why don't you just shoot him? Why don't you beam him into space? Because it, it, <laughs> that feels like... Oh, I would have loved that. <laughs> it feels like that sort of breaking the logic of the episode or, or breaking the world a little bit. And you don't want to do that. You don't really want reality to, to penetrate that world. I would have liked it if they caught Wesley and they gouged his eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> that's very Star Trek doing that I mean what what do you think of the character of Robin Leffler um, I, I actually think she's pretty decent as a one off character they've given her this oh I've got Leffler's laws as a one two quirk off, two off character is that such a thing someone who was standing in a scene and got name checked and then a one off character <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was going to say we've certainly had these sort of one-off interactions with a sort of love or semi-love interest for a member of the crew and they're they're often quite interchangeable this one felt it it stood out a bit more i mean if you asked me to recount details of it i would struggle but it, in my mind in my mind it it's i can separate it from the homogenized others at the moment but then maybe that's just because i watched it yesterday i i think ashley judd is a is a decent actor and i think that that always helps and i actually you know i i don't mind the romance i think it's quite nice i think their casual clothes or their date clothes look better than a lot of uh non-uniforms on star trek and i think they do have an, an all right kind of chemistry i think they always struggle with both romances and female characters on the next generation i don't think there's really much dispute about that but i, I would say this one isn't horrible. I think it it is just that thing that Wesley just feels way too young for this still. You feel like it's more of a Geordie plot. Yeah. And actually, 
Oh, if we're rewriting it, Geordie not being able to play the game because of his visor. Oh, man. Yeah. Missed tricks. Uh, R- Riker was, was desperate to get Geordie to play that game. Oh, we've just improved the episode by accident. <laughs> I had forgotten, but I was just going to say... Remember the scene at the the top of the episode where Riker's trying to get people to play the game and Counselor Troy is sitting in 10 forward eating a chocolate fudge sundae? Oh, that was awful. Yeah. Isn't that so bad? That This is her only character trait outside of work. <laughs> uh, and then she describes how to eat uh, a chocolate fudge sundae. Doesn't he say something like to her, like, is that real chocolate? No, it's not. It's replicated. We don't have anything real on this ship. Everything in that conversation felt off. Surely in the future, if they've got synthahol, they've got synth chocolate. She's she's a little underserved by this. Uh, I I guess. Um by the by this episode or this show. The show. <laughs> what do you think I, I guess of the the resolution using data uh, as the kind of plot device. I quite like the chase with Wesley. We don't know if he's fixed data at this point through the ship. Force field's going up. He uses a, a transporter. I feel we've seen similar things to this and we'll see similar things again. I guess because there's only so many ways you can run down a starship corridor. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. It's the kind of resolution you have to have. Could it have been something cleverer? Yeah, probably. But having having that time-honoured trope of i think i fixed this thing but has it worked and i'm discovering at the last second that it has no it's like a comfy pair of shoes isn't it i always felt when i watched this first time around that i didn't think wesley got enough credit for saving the day i felt they were they very much focused on data and it's like well done for shining that lamp in her face data good for you and the, the whole point with wesley was he was buying time wasn't he and it, when you first watch it i think you don't really get that but every subsequent time it it does make sense it does work yeah i think i think it does work it it does kind of make sense because otherwise you're just like what what are you doing getting a shuttle get out of there Mm. but yeah no it's it's good it's solid Uh, actually holding up a torch and flashing it in a dark room quite visually effective although (laughs) really there should be a warning yeah there absolutely should be a warning yeah but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that wraps it up. I think we all quite like this one. Yeah, I think that's pretty much everything, isn't it? There's, there's weirdly not a lot to say on it because it is very straightforward. But and it's it's not it's not easy to tear apart because it's just an enjoyable hour with adverts. It's it's a, it's effectively done. They have their story. They know what they're doing. They they execute it. There was many potential banana skins in the way uh, including bringing back Will Wheaton it is perhaps worth saying that in another season we might have had a slightly different reaction to it I think it works well here because it is unlike other episodes that we have had around this time in this season and the end of season 4 so it stands out a bit if it, if it was in season 1 and 2 it wouldn't stand out in the same way so, swings and roundabouts. I think it benefits from its placement. And you'd have to say that Will Wheaton leaving the show and then getting an episode like this a season later, which is probably more than he would have got to have done across an entire season, it kind of justifies it for him, I feel, in some ways. It's just like, yeah, you get to be the star of an episode, you get to come in, and then you don't have to sit there for another 16 weeks saying... I captain before you get something else to do. On the other hand, he doesn't get paid all that time that he would have been sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. But if you can just wait around for nearly 30 years, uh, we can find a role for you again. Uh, no, no, it won't It won't be good. No, it won't be good. It, it will be cringeworthy and, and awful and and you'll you'll play it like you're presenting a YouTube show. Um, which you might also be spending your time doing as well. But, uh, you know, it's something to look forward to. We, we can't say that the the franchise has not financially compensated Will Wheaton now. And, unless he's not getting paid for that. I mean, I, I can't tell. He seems so happy to be there that I assume it must be a truckload. He wasn't in the script. He just turned up on set. Just been taking photos of them <laughs> filming. 
<laughs> with a telephoto lens. Right. Let's see if we've got anything else worthwhile to say in a place that we call Quickfire. Quickfire. Jonathan Freaks described the computer graphics as tuba on a checkboard. <laughs> He's funny. <laughs> The Star Trek The Next Generation Companion. I'm just having a look at some of the production notes. I do note that it says that Will Wheaton made a conscious decision to play Wesley as, quote, a little hipper, showing him as a ladies' man and a cadet (laughs) capable of pulling a practical joke or two. I mean, well, that was a failure, wasn't it? (laughs) Also of note in this book, uh, it mentions that Michael Pillar was pleased with the story treatment and said that it also marked the birth of a good writer, saying, If you can get away with having Troy describe how to eat chocolate for 35 seconds so that it doesn't slow the story down, then you're doing something. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean that assumes it didn't slow the story down. <laughs> this was uh, Brandon Braga's first assignment after joining the staff he'd started off as an intern and and then would would later go on to write two star trek movies and, and a mission impossible movie because of that and the worst mission impossible movie but they only got story credit on it never mind and then obviously he would uh, show run voyager and and create enterprise so you can see the beginning of of the the death of Star Trek in this episode in some ways. Don't you dare diss Star Trek Enterprise. I'm I'm gonna I think that's too cruel even for me. I can say so. <laughs> so you can see the beginning of an important chapter in Star Trek in this episode. <laughs> He's now executive producer on the Orville. Just because we're we're pretty much contractually obligated, uh I mean there's no contract in place, but it doesn't really matter. Uh to mention nitpicks from the nitpickers guide uh we'll just we'll just check in briefly phil says that there's a plot oversight that picard is willing to play the game but wesley isn't i mean i I think you're looking into it too deeply but i mean that could really be the premise for the entire book but also it's you don't see him do it there's nothing to say how he ended up doing it i just i can't even be bothered to work up the enthusiasm to pull apart that book anymore. We're now Christ knows how many pages in. And it really hasn't improved. This is the first appearance of the cadet uniform, which looks pretty much like what will become the sort of Deep Space Nine and Voyager duty uniform. It's a nice design. I did think that was strange looking at it. I was thinking, why why is he suddenly wearing the future uniform. I don't think that that looks better than the TNG uniform. No, but they had to change things because they wanted to sell more stuff. Wesley and Picard discuss Boothby in this episode. He's going to turn up soon enough. It does seem that Robin Leffler has made multiple appearances in spin-off media which has led to many of her laws being known. So, here are the known Robin's laws. Number one, you can only count on yourself. Twelve, execution is nine-tenths of the job. Seventeen, when all else fails, do it yourself. Twenty-six, never lie, not even when it's easier than telling the truth. She breaks that law in this episode, doesn't she? Yeah, she does. 29. (laughs) The sightseeing's just as good on the way home. What? (laughs) 32. If life hands you lemonade, don't try to make lemons out of it. I I don't like Leffler's laws. (laughs) 36. You gotta go with what works. 42. Any joke that has to be explained isn't worth explaining. That's not worthy of a law. It's also it's completely against the uh, the mantra of uh, Phil Farrand. <laughs> 46. Life isn't always fair. 52. Never underestimate a man's ability to make you laugh. Oh, God. But not a woman. <laughs> 83. 
Whenever you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I feel that that might not be an original law. (laughs) (laughs) 91. Always watch your back. 103. A couple of light years can't keep good friends apart. So that that's where the the laws from the game end. Right. As in that's the last one that appears in the game. That feels like something that's written on a in paint on a bit of wood and stuck up in a shabby chic kitchen next to something saying live, laugh, love. <laughs> one hundred and eight. It's not over until it's over. And sometimes not even then. <laughs> Those are lyrics, aren't they? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It was like, that sounds like something off a Space Girls album track. 116. When someone is trying to kill you, it's okay to sweat. 117. Never send a Klingon a Tribble. And the final one. 125. Getting information out of Zach Kebron is like interrogating a statue. Is that is something specific to one situation really worthy of a law? Well, it is when it's Zach Hebron. Zach Efron. Yeah. Well, thank thanks for sharing all of those. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening once again. We will be back again next time where we will be watching unification we'll do that all as one episode just in case you're watching along and i know that anyone who was watching along gave up on that a very long time ago but anyway we'll catch you then goodbye 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 reading this that Q might have killed Robin Leffler's child. Mm-hmm.